Okay. Yep. I'm not sure how to fix that, and the IT person has left. Or does it do it automatically? Can you hear me over Zoom now? Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. All right. So we've got to figure it figured out. Okay. So it is our custom at ACU to begin with an acknowledgement of country. We commence our meeting by acknowledging the first peoples and traditional custodians of the country where Dionoy is located the Wurundjeri peoples from the Kulin Nation. We respectfully acknowledge their elders past and present and remember that they have passed on their wisdom to us in various ways. Let us hold this in trust as we work together and serve our communities. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor Christian Berry. Professor Berry is director of the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University and co-editor of the Journal of Political Philosophy. His research focuses on ethical theory, philosophy of action, and international justice. And he will be speaking to us today about a very timely topic, uh, climate change and accounting for who is responsible for climate change emissions. I think we've got it figured out, Dimitri. Okay, so please uh, take it away. Oh, and the talk will go for about an hour and then there will be uh, time for Q&A after that. Thank you. Yeah. Move the slides on here. Is it just? Uh, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So just. The, I think this is just the computer being slow. Okay. Yep. And that'll show up there. Hi. It's, well, it's really good to be here. Uh, I'm really delighted to see some familiar faces, um, and to finally get to visit the institute. Um, I know it's been a challenging period for you all, uh, which makes me all the the more grateful that you've found time to turn out to hear my talk um, in solidarity. I think it's, um, it's been one of the most interesting sort of ventures, academic ventures in Australia um, in a long time. And it's like one of the few sort of dynamic entrepreneurial outfits, um, which is really setting a high bar for research. Um, it's something that ANU is like extremely pleased to have as a partner in Australian philosophy, and I very much hope that it continues uh, in, in, a good, in a good way. Okay, so today's talk, and I should begin by saying that um, this is based on joint work with Garrett Cullody, who's a colleague of mine at the ANU. So I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that um, net zero has become the basic frame of climate action over the last five or 10 years, it's very difficult to find entities of any size that don't claim to have some sort of net zero target. This university has one, net zero by 2030. My university also has one, net zero by 2030. Um, and one thing to ask is, well, what is sort of distinctive about net zero discourse? Well, one thing that it seems to be distinctive about it is that it singles out a particular clear goal, um, a zero point. And if you achieve that zero point, it confers a certain status. So previously, of course, people were often talking about climate action and the need for reductions, but there hadn't been a particular point that is sort of singled out as sort of a salient target for climate action. The second is that in doing so, it seems to be a satiable target, right? It's not just that we need to forever be making reductions 
um, but rather that we have a clear point that we're aiming at to get by, at, to, to achieve at a particular point in time. Another thing is that the net zero idea is that it suggests this sort of balance, that there's sort of a credit side and a debit side of emissions. And your goal is to get to where your credits and your debits balance out. So, and it is kind of interesting to see how many different entities have adopted net zero targets, which previously had not really adopted targets of any clear sort, aside from paying some kind of lip service to the importance of dealing with the environment. So for those reasons, there's something that it looks like it was sort of a galvanizing frame for climate action. Um, but there are a lot of worries that people have had about net zero as a frame of climate action. One is that it can sort of create the false impression of taking real action while committing yourself to targets far in the future. Burn now, pay later. Um, it also, in singling out a particular point in time at which we will aim to achieve global net zero, um, it doesn't mention anything about the significance of the shape of the slope by which we achieve that point. And of course, if we're simply committing to getting to net zero in 2050, until we reach that point, we'll still be emitting more carbon net. Uh, and if we, and how quickly we get there makes a big difference to how much carbon there's actually gonna be in the atmosphere. So uh, it's not that, um, it makes a big difference just how we get to net zero and not just that we do get to net zero. Um, another concern is just that, well, uh, the net zero idea as I framed it with its credit and its debit side, a lot of attention has been paid to the credits, namely offsets, which are often seen as dubious. Um, some of them clearly are. Uh, often they're also seen as people banking on future technologies in carbon storage coming online that have somehow saved the day, which Pope Francis just yesterday said was like pushing a snowball downhill uh, and warned against in his first, he, just in time, he made his first major intervention on the climate um, the day before my talk at ACU since 2015 in the Lodato Sea. And he emphasized the importance of not sort of focusing on unlikely technological fixes in the form of carbon storage that will somehow allow us to achieve net zero without making very significant alterations to lifestyle. Um, and another, another point that has often been raised is whether net zero is not on the one hand, not demanding enough in that there are certain countries historical emitters, for example, that are really obliged to go far beyond net zero, that there are many countries which should be net negative. And on the other hand, that it may be too demanding of others, that there may be certain countries which given their resources and their capacities for making an energy transition, can't without rather significant cost achieve national net zero targets. Okay, so I'm going to um, set aside most of those worries, although some of the things that I'm going to talk about will be relevant to them. And I'm going to focus on just one aspect of the sort of net zero idea, and that is how we should understand the debit side. So, and I'm going to narrow it further still in that I'm not going to be talking about all different agents which have net zero targets, but only about countries. So I'm gonna be focusing on specific, the specific question of how countries should understand this debit side of their net zero ledger. Namely, how should it do its emissions accounting for the purposes of determining whether or not it has achieved its national net zero target. Um, and of course, there's a companion question, which I, I'll touch on later, but it's not gonna be the focus today, which is how should it do its removals? That is, what should it count as credits on its net zero ledger? Okay, so 
Um, the structure of the talk is as follows. So in the first section, I'm just going to be making some interpretive claims about what countries present themselves as doing in committing themselves to net zero targets. And that, that interpretive work is gonna be relevant to assessing different proposals for how countries might do their accounting. Um, I don't think that we can settle the question of how countries should do their accounting without interpreting what countries take themselves to be doing in committing themselves to national net zero targets and what they present themselves as doing. I'm then gonna discuss some of the options in, in the literature that have been proposed for how countries should do their emissions accounting uh, and draw attention to what I take to be some pretty significant problems with each of them. And then I'm gonna propose an alternative way of doing this accounting, which I call participatory value chain accounting, and then just discuss uh, in closing a few issues about the proposal. Okay, so the first thing just to note is that <clears throat> how a country, how we should do this business of emissions accounting is far from obvious. And if you just take a simple example, uh, of mobile phones, which gives a relatively short supply chain involving a series of different countries that are all involved in the inputs and production and consumption of some good. So in this case, we have a firm that is producing mobile phones for export to another country. The production facility is powered through the burning of coal purchased from yet another country. Some of the components are sourced from yet another country, and the finished product is then transported through a, a, an additional country for delivery to the customer. So then the question is, emissions occur through this process, and which country should claim these emissions? Okay, so what are we asking when we're saying which countries should claim these emissions? We're asking for the purposes of net zero accounting, which, country, which countries should claim these emissions as belonging to their debit ledger? And I think this question of attributability of emissions, it's important to distinguish from accountability for emissions, that is, emissions for which you may owe some sort of justification, and also culpability for emissions, that is emissions for which you could be blamed. There may be uh, emissions that I'm accountable for, which don't make sense to put them on my ledger. So for example, say I'm not one of these countries at all, but I'm, a, I'm an additional country, F, which is able to, at the snap of its fingers, confer green sourced energy to the entire value chain. Um, but I don't do that. Clearly, I have some accountability. I could be answerable. People can ask me, well, look, these emissions happen because you culpably failed to provide at very little cost something that could have greened up the whole operation. But it, seems, it would seem strange to say that, that I emitted, or that that country is, has emitted. And there may be countries which, um, where we want to say that they are non culpably emitting, say a poor country that is going to be have net positive emissions um, because it simply doesn't have the capacity to green up its production facilities. It's non culpable. It needs to run an energy grid that supplies hospitals and helps create roads and infrastructure and all the rest of it. Um, but we don't want to say it's net zero simply because it's not culpable for any emissions that it's actually creating. Okay, so, but just how should we settle this question of attributability of how to allocate the emissions to these different actors? Well, I think that the question of attributability partly depends on the context. So what is the context in which countries are making net zero declarations. Well, 
first of all, what are these targets? Net zero targets are commitments to making no net addition by a certain date to global atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. Right. So these are commitments by states not to make an addition to global greenhouse gases by a particular date. In the IPCC report, the particular target that is focused on um, is 2050. And the reason it's chosen is that the most likely pathways for limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees require achieving net zero by this date. Three other features of the context that seem important. One is that climate change is an ethical issue because of the burdens that it imposes on people, in particular climate vulnerable people. Again, Pope Francis in the Laudato Si talked about how we must hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor is the way he represented the claims of climate vulnerable people. The second is that climate change mitigation requires collective action that the focal point towards which global cooperation is directed is the goal of reaching net zero by mid-century. So these declarations are being undertaken in the context in which people are discussing a joint goal, a collective goal of global net zero. And a third feature of the context is that not all countries have credibly adopted national net zero targets. Some countries have not adopted net zero targets at all, and some have adopted targets but are not credibly committed to them. They don't have anything resembling a feasible action plan that would enable them actually to achieve net zero by that particular date. Okay, so when countries are adopting national net zero targets, they refer to these, these commitments as nationally determined contributions to global net zero. Right? So they're presenting their national target, and so we can distinguish between the global target of achieving a global economy, which is carbon neutral. They're presenting their national target of achieving carbon neutrality as a contribution to the global goal of global net zero. Okay. So those are the sort of the key elements in what they're presenting themselves as doing. So the system of accounting that they should be adopting had better be one, which is such that they can present their achieving net zero according to that accounting method as a constructive contribution to the collective goal of becoming global net zero. Okay. So if this is right, um, then there are two groups which states are morally answerable for meeting the national net zero commitments that they've made. The first group is to the climate vulnerable right, for reducing their contribution to the burdens imposed on them by having net positive emissions. And the second is to other participants in the global effort of achieving global net zero. Okay. Namely, they're accountable for making the contribution that they have declared that they will make in this collective effort. So then if that's right, then the question is what method of emissions accounting needs to be used for the attainment of national net zero as assessed by that method to be able to satisfy those two claims. The claims on behalf of the climate vulnerable and the claims on behalf of other participants in this global effort of achieving global net zero. Okay. So, what are our options? Well, the first option, which is the currently prevailing mode of emissions accounting, 
is usually referred to as production-based accounting. Uh, it's probably more accurately described as territorially-based accounting. And according to production-based accounting, basically, if it's burned in your territory, it goes on your ledger. And if it's not burned in your territory, it doesn't. Um, so I think that this mode of accounting has some virtues. One is directness, that it would seem to be a little bit odd if a country did not take credit for emissions that were released within its territory, the area over which it has jurisdictional control. If anything counts as emissions that a country is adding to the atmosphere, might seem that intuitively these must be included. Second, complete, it has the virtue of completeness uh, in the sense that uh, if all countries took account, did accounting in this way and all achieved net zero, we would achieve global net zero. So if all countries actually did reduce this, there's a slight amendment one needs to make, which is that at the moment, Countries, no countries actually take credit for the use of bunker fuels, like in ships and aviation. Um, they, because they technically don't take place in anyone's jurisdiction, but surely there would be a way of eliminating that problem with the way in which it's currently used so that you simply count, you know, where it leaves airspace and where it enters airspace as the two countries in which it's produced and you could come up with some method of doing so. But assuming we would do that, we would have completeness. Um, and a country could then say, well, look, if I do reach production-based net zero, then I am doing what, if all others did this, we would achieve global net zero. Right? So that certainly is a, a strong feature of this um, method. Another is that it's feasible because it's something that we're already doing, right? So it doesn't require any new, uh, sophisticated capacity to measure or anything of that sort. Um, all the data on production-based emissions already exist. They're currently being used by different countries. Um, and the third, again, is that the, the idea that, well, you know, countries, it sort of makes sense that countries should at least take credit or debit for those emissions um, that take place in areas where it has jurisdictional authority. They have say over how things get done within their national territory. And by hypothesis, this should make them, the emissions resulting from what happens on their territory attributable to them. Okay. But I think there are some a pretty significant problem with production-based accounting. The main problem is that it allows a country to reach net zero by displacing its, its em emissions upstream. That is, a country could shut down its own emissions releasing production facilities and import consumer goods produced through higher emitting processes elsewhere and it's hard to see how that would be a constructive contribution to global net zero. So green production is just an example of this. Right. So th this is again, this is sort of a case where a country, it used to produce emissions, now it doesn't produce them, but it's importing goods from another country, the production of which creates even more emissions. So this is uh, not just a fanciful example in the sense that there has been a shift, especially among relatively wealthy countries, from being net exporters of emissions to net importers of emissions. So if you actually look at the, the uh, trajectories of emissions of rich industrialized countries, their production-based emissions have been declining, um, but in some cases, their consumption-based consumption, which I'll explain in a moment, that is 
the emissions that are embedded in the goods and services that they consume have either been increasing or have been declining at a much less steep slope than their production-based emissions. Right. So green production just simply gives an example of the sort, where this is a case where this restructure of its, econ of its economy um, is such that uh, it's actually continuing to, it's economically dependent on causally sustaining net positive emissions in this case, even though the location of those emissions has changed. So uh, often economists refer to this sort of phenomenon, they call it carbon leakage. So this is this idea that um, it's, you're not sort of taking account of carbon emissions that you're effectively driving because it's not happening within your territory. So in, in response to these sorts of concerns, another method of accounting that has been presented uh, is called consumption-based accounting. And you guessed it, uh, this would not have the problem that production-based accounting accounting has in that if a country was consuming lots of goods and services that involved emissions, that's where the emissions would get attached to their account, right? So this former example of green production would not register according to consumption-based accounting as a reduction in the country's emissions. Why? Because in fact, it's consuming even more emissions than it was previously. Before it was consuming emissions that it was producing, now it's consuming emissions that others are producing. So it would, not, it would register as an increase rather than a decrease. So one advantage is that it prevents this sort of carbon leakage that I described previously. It also retains completeness in the sense that um, if all countries actually achieved net zero according to consumption-based accounting, then we also would achieve global net zero. Okay. It also seems to target the economic source of the problem, namely consumer, it's demand for things that effectively people are commissioning others to emit on their behalf. And another thing that, in light of what I said previously, that some people have argued would be beneficial about a consumption-based accounting system is that it would bring more emissions within the scope of national commitments. And what they mean by that is that some of the countries with the most ambitious targets are precisely those countries where their production-based emissions are already been decreasing, but they're consumption emissions are not. So the thought is that if we switch to consumption-based accounting, then these relatively wealthy countries with ambitious targets would have more to work with and the reductions would be more significant. Okay. So I'll start with the last supposed advantage. Um, it's not very clear to me that really is such an advantage because it seems to assume that, that countries are indifferent to the cost of their commitments so that if we somehow switched accounting systems, they would just be much more aggressive in their mitigation. But it's far from obvious that that's true. So it doesn't seem to be um, an accident that production-based accounting is being adopted, uh, that the ambitious targets are precisely by those countries where they are already on a trajectory of reducing their production-based emissions. So telling them that they're going to do consumption-based accounting, it's far from clear that they would stick with their original targets framed in terms of production-based accounting and simply transfer them over. Um, but that is not, I think, the, um, the most significant worry about consumption-based accounting. The most serious worry I have about consumption-based accounting is that it allows a country to reach net zero by downstream displacement. 
that is a country could switch to consuming goods with no embedded emissions but simultaneously fund the consumption by exporting fossil fuels to be burned elsewhere. And that also would hardly seem to be a constructive contribution to global net zero. So green consumption is an example of this sort of thing. So this is a case where a country is reducing to zero its consumption-based emissions, but it's simultaneously producing more emissions or enabling the production of more em emissions by others. So again, in this case too, the worry is look, if you're presenting your national net zero target as a contribution to achieving global net zero, it should not be such that you could achieve that national net zero target in a way that is actually helping to sustain or drive higher emissions globally. Okay, another way of trying to track emissions is what's called broadly uh, input-based accounting. And there are some different variants of it um, the most prominent of which is sometimes called extraction-based accounting. And the idea here is, again, it would sort of close a potential loophole that you could see in both production-based and consumption-based accounting. So in the Australian context, this is, I think, mean, resonates with some people in that Australia is a big exporter of coal. If that coal gets burned somewhere else, it doesn't go on Australia's ledger. So it could achieve production-based net zero while simultaneously driving up global emissions through its export of coal. Uh, that would also not register necessarily on a consumption-based accounting system either, in that it could be greening up its consumption while still selling coal to countries which are not, not net zero aligned with the effect that it would be helping to sort of causally sustain higher emissions while claiming itself to be national net zero. So extraction-based accounting tries to close that off by targeting sort of the direct physical source of emissions. Um, and it, it, one of the advantages is that it seems to capture downstream emissions. It also may be easier to apply in that while there are lots of different places where emissions can be produced and lots and lots and lots of places in which goods and services which involve the release of emissions can be consumed, there are relatively few places in which fossil fuels are actually extracted. So it would be relatively easy to track and through expectation of what emissions would result from which extraction of which fuels um, you could apply this relatively easily. <clears throat> the, the other um, there are a couple of problems with the extraction based variant. One is that there are emissions um, which aren't, don't result from fossil fuels. So that would actually, it doesn't actually have the feature of completeness, which the other two modes of accounting have. So even if it were true that every country achieved extraction-based net zero, there would still be other greenhouse gases that could be released such that you would not achieve global net zero, even while each country could truly say that they'd achieved extraction-based net zero. <clears throat> now, people have tried to come up with different modes of accounting that share the basic idea of this, which is that it's sort of focusing on inputs, um, namely <clears throat> one that sort of takes all the factors that go into production 
land, capital, labor, entrepreneurship that are upstream and they somehow get counted. So you would be taking account of all of the downstream effects of your um, production, export, extraction, and you would be trying to <clears throat> make yourself net zero in that space. <clears throat> So I think the, the more significant worry about any variant of this sort of input-based accounting is that it also allows for displacement of the sort that we recognize, thanks, Demon, uh, in the other two modes of accounting. In particular, it could allow a country to achieve net zero by stop exporting fossil fuels to be burned elsewhere, importing them instead to be burned in its own territory. Right? So it's reducing the emissions that arise from its inputs, the inputs that it's putting into production, but it couldn't really present itself as making a constructive contribution to the global goal of achieving global net zero if all it was doing was um, burning fossil fuels in its own territory, whereas previously it sold them to be burned elsewhere. So in all three of these cases, the same pattern of argument I've been using, namely that the problem is that they allow a country to achieve national net zero in such a way that it can't satisfy this claim that it wants to be making, namely presenting its achieving this target as a constructive contribution to this global goal. Because in each of these ways, um, it could be acting in a way that is doing nothing to actually facilitate the achievement of this global goal, even while making steady progress to becoming carbon neutral according to these methods. Okay, so I've used um, this idea of displacement in describing this. I talked about how in each of these cases, a country would be making a kind of um, superficial change to the structure of its economy for the purposes of carbon intensivity, such that the emissions are displaced in a way that is out of focus of the accounting method that they're using. But we, sh we should stop to ask, well, what is problematic about this sort of displacement? Now, it might be tempting to say, well, in the examples that I was giving, uh, this sort of displacement would be a way in which a country could make changes to its economy with the effect of uh, the effect that global emissions go up. But I actually don't think um, that's a very good that's a very good answer. Um, and the reason is that I think there are cases where a country can restructure its economy in such a way that the result is that emissions go up, while it can credibly claim to be making a constructive contribution to achieving global net zero. So for example, um, in this case of independence, where a country uh, has previously been using low emissions processes to produce consumer goods for export while consuming emissions intensive imports, it now restructures its economy, producing its own consumer goods using emission-free processes and withdrawing from the export market. A new emissions intensive producers from non-net zero aligned states enter the market with the result the global emissions go up. So this is a case where the country is not resourcing emissions, it's not producing emissions and it's not consuming emissions. And I think we want to say in this case 
um, they are, in fact, tracking their emissions in such a way that they could present themselves as making a constructive contribution to global net zero. They're doing what we all collectively effectively need to do to bring our global emissions into balance. But it just so happens that other countries are, because of its getting out of these markets, getting into these markets and emitting more. But it seems that the emissions resulting from these new market entrants should not be attributed to X, the country that's withdrawing from any reliance on fossil fuels, but to these new entrants. So if there's something wrong with displacement, it can't just be that it allows emissions to go up because it does seem that there would be ways in which a country could act with the effect that emissions go up without it being the case that those emissions should be attributed to that country. Um, so how to get, get what's sort of going on here? Um, well, stepping back from emissions, just use a simple analogy. So imagine that the neighbors along the street agree that each will clear the snow off the footpath in front of their own house to clear the street for pedestrians. So this has the same structure that the net zero case has where each of them are claiming that they're going to be doing something as a contribution to this more general goal. Now, if I commit myself to this goal and I merely clear off the top layer of snow from my front path and claim that's what I meant when I agreed to clear one's path, um, then this seems clearly not an acceptable interpretation because it's not true that if all act in this way, the collective goal will be achieved. Um, it also won't be achieved if I clear the snow in front of my footpath by dumping it into Steve's footpath next door. Right. Why is that? Well, because what I'm effectively doing in, in, by shoveling the snow onto Steve's, in, onto Steve's part of the footpath is constitutes an obstruction of this global goal. It's not that it makes this goal of a clear path unattainable, but what it does is it's interposing an, obstruct an obstruction to it. So it would be strange if I sort of presented, look, I, I'm, my contribution to our goal of removing all the snow from, from the footpath is to shovel my snow, um, but I'm going to count my shoveling my snow onto Steve's on the same footpath, just a little bit down as a contribution to that goal. So it seems that what we need to, what's going on with displacement in these sort of displacement cases is that what I'm doing is effectively creating an impediment to our achieving this global goal, not just by having a sort of a causal effect, but by constitutively doing something that needs to be undone for us to achieve that goal. Okay, now, um, going back to emissions. So, Again, global net zero is the, is the goal in this case. And it's something that needs to be sustained. And it's constituted by the global economies being structured in such a way that it doesn't create any net emissions. So it needs, as a whole, the global economy needs to be structured so it's not dependent on causally sustaining positive emissions. But the extent to which a country 
remains economically dependent on causally sustaining positive emissions, it is obstructing the attainment of that goal. Right? So in all of the first few examples I gave, these were examples of cases where a country was um, dependent on causally sustaining emissions. Right? It can be dependent on causally sustaining emissions through different modes, right? Through its consumption, through its extraction and sale, or through its own production. Um, that's not true in the case of independence, right? A country that withdraws from these markets and effectively becomes, is, is not producing or inputting or consuming any emissions, is not remaining economically dependent on causally sustaining net positive emissions. So that's a clear difference between that country and these other countries. It's true that it acts with the effect of emissions going up, but its relationship to that raise in emissions is quite different than in the other cases. That's not to say that if a country knew that its emissions, it's, it's becoming fully green, might result in global emissions, that might give it a reason to remain emissions non-neutral. <laughs> um, it merely suggests that for the purposes of attributing emissions, that those emissions then don't get attributed to that agent if they go ahead with becoming carbon neutral in these ways. Okay. So um, I noted three different ways at the outset in which the organization of some country's economy can obstruct the attainment of global net zero. One is through domestic production emissions, or two, through demand for goods that are produced using emissions, or the sale of exported goods and resources for downstream emissions. I I claim that production-based accounting was problematic because it permits obstruction of types two and three. Consumption-based accounting because it, it permitted obstruction type one and three. And input-based accounting because it permitted obstruction of the first and the second sorts. So each of these accounting methods permit the achievement of net zero in ways that obstruct in these different ways. So to avoid, if that's right, then to avoid this problem, we need a system of accounting that counts emissions of all of these types on a country's ledger. If it can ca capture both these midstream emissions through production, downstream emissions, and upstream emissions, then it won't be the case that it has a way of becoming net zero in a way that allows it to obstruct in virtue of driving emissions in these other ways. Okay. All right, now one might object that, um, look, I'm being too hard on these modes of accounting. So couldn't someone say, look, um, if each country ch attained production-based accounting, then we would together reach this global, net, this global goal. So by reaching it, I am making a constructive contribution. And I think that the reply is that, and what, what was sort of implicit in all the examples, is that in a context in which all countries really are committed to production-based net zero, then it would be a constructive contribution. But it's one of the features of the context that I mentioned at the outset is that not all countries are committed to production-based net zero. And this allows one country to become production-based net zero in such a way that is effectively displacing emissions to another country which is not production-based, not committed to this goal. That's the mechanism through which it can actually be obstructive of this 
attainment of the global goal. In the current context, not all countries have these targets or are credibly committed to them. And as a result, it makes it possible for a country to attain and sustain that, um, that state of being production-based net zero while remaining economically dependent on causally sustaining positive global emissions through its interactions with other trading partners, which are not committed to production-based net zero. So the, one thing just to bear in mind here is that these global net zero is not a commitment to becoming net zero now. It's a commitment to achieving a global economy that is net zero at a particular date. So if you're only interacting in your trade with other countries that are credibly committed to actually achieving production-based net zero by that date, then your consumption emissions or your extraction-based emissions for, resulting from trade with those other countries don't make it the case that you're actually obstructing the achievement of that global goal because all of these countries that you're interacting with are also committed to that goal and are thereby moving towards it. Okay. So, what we need is a criterion that can capture this important feature. The first feature is that there are multiple ways in which we can causally sustain emissions. And the second is that whether or not um, our interactions with a trading partner are causally sustaining emissions in a way that's inconsistent with the global goal depends on whether or not our trading partners are credibly committed to these goals. Okay. So this brings us to the proposal. So the proposal again is presented as a proposal for emissions accounting that would enable countries which achieve net zero according to this method of accounting as having made a constructive contribution to this global goal. So the criterion is that emissions should be attributed to a country when it produces those emissions on its own territory or why another country is not credibly committed to a net zero target and X pays Y to produce or supply goods or services for it and as part of producing or supplying those goods and services, Y conducts activities through which those emissions are attributed to Y, or X produces and sells a product, the use of which by Y will produce those emissions. So the first clause is simply production-based accounting. And the second clause is saying that, is trying to capture both input-based accounting and consumption-based accounting with respect to countries that are not themselves net zero aligned. With countries that are credibly committed to net zero targets, it permits a country not to count its consumption-based and input-based emissions arising from trade with those countries on its ledger. Okay, so a few things just to, to raise. And so is it to then be clear how this would capture, this would block the displacement moves of the three sorts that I started at the outset. In each case it would. So in the case of the production-based 
displacement, the green production, it would capture both the emissions that it produces, and then after its change of its economy, it would continue to track the emissions um, that X pays Y to produce for it. In the second case, where a country makes this change so that they're no longer positive, uh, net positive in the space of consumption-based emissions, it tracks the emissions that they're producing via clause one, and also any emissions that they're resourcing through clause 2B. And in the third case, again, it tracks the emissions that a country which gets out of the extraction business nevertheless produces or consumes. Okay. Um, now, so far I've just been talking about the debit side of the ledger, but one might naturally ask, well, how does this, how, what would the implications of any of this be to the removal side? Um, and without, one, without going into it too much, one natural extension of this sort of idea would be that just as you have to take account of emissions that take place within your value chain, when those emissions are resulting from interactions with trade partners that are not credibly committed to um, net zero, you could also claim the removals that take place at any point in the chain. So I'll just end by talking through just a couple of sort of issues. The first is scope. Um, so when, when we say that a country is net zero aligned, what does that mean? Well, at present, what, what that simply means is that it has a net zero target that it's credibly committed to. Now at present, the way in which countries have made these commitments, they're all commitments about becoming production-based net zero. So they're not making commitments about reducing their consumption emissions, but just about the production emissions. So what that means then is if I was inter if one country was interacting with another and that other country had a production-based net zero target that it was credibly committed to, all that but the proposal would allow the country um, to do would be not to claim on its ledger the production-based emissions of that other country, right? So it would not have to claim them even if it was consuming goods and services from this country that produced them, given that that country had a production-based net zero target. But this only follows if that country is really committed to that target and they're actually doing their accounting fully and reasonably. And what it doesn't include though, is any further upstream emissions that might ar arise from further trade that that country might have with other partners, which are not net zero aligned. So if some of the inputs to its production were arising from trade with other countries, which are not net zero aligned, then the emissions arising from that trade would also have to go on the ledger of the importer country because it's not covered by a credible net zero commitment. Only the production-based emissions of their trading partner is. Now, if a country had instead a net zero target, which did the kind of accounting that I'm recommending that they did, and they were credibly committed to that, then you wouldn't have to worry about anything because they would effectively be taking full account of their upstream and downstream emissions. Okay, a second is, well, what is, 
credible commitment mean? I mean, I don't have anything particularly fancy to say about it, except that it means you have to have a target and you have to be taking steps that show that it's feasible for you to attain it, that you are robustly pursuing it in some sense. Um, on any defensible criterion of credible commitment, many countries which currently have net zero targets are not credibly committed to them, including this country. Um, so the mere fact that they have the target would not be sufficient for a country trading with them to not have to do full value chain accounting in their interactions with, with this country. One might worry about feasible. So one, one might, there might be two different types of feasibility worries. One is like, is there any chance that country, anybody's gonna sign up to this? Um, and if, if not, then what's the point? Well, if it's really true that no country is gonna sign up to this, um, then, Country, all countries need to scale back what they claim on behalf of their net zero targets. I'm just offering a way of doing accounting that they would have to be doing if they could present their net zero targets in the way in which they currently seem to be presenting them. Another way in which you might think it would be infeasible is just like, it would just be extremely hard to, to to enact and sustain and it would, the reporting burdens would be massive and so on and so forth. Um, and again, this, you know, that could be true too. Right? And again, if that's really true, then it just shows that the type of accounting that countries would have to do to be able to show that they're being responsive to the claims that could be made against them, given what they're saying about their net zero commitments can't be done. And so the rhetoric around this needs to be scaled back. Another thing my thought that might go back to the, the worry uh, for my initial point, which is that, well, net zero targets seem to be getting people active a little bit. So isn't that a good thing? And if you come in and with some much broader set of requirements, that might just turn them off and that might be counterproductive. Um, and to which I'd say, yeah, if that's true, then then maybe we shouldn't be trying to propose this for countries to actually adopt. But I'm not really, at the moment, putting this forward as a proposal that countries ought to adopt. I'm putting it forward as a proposal of what countries would have to adopt for them to be able to deliver on the commitments they present themselves as making. Um, there may still be some value in encouraging them to stick with methods of accounting which do not allow them to deliver on those claims. Um, but that I take is a separate issue. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Start back now? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I, so I can keep track. All right, let's go ahead and, uh, and get back started.
So we will have about until uh, six o'clock for discussion, after which there will be a reception in the foyer. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please raise your hand. There are also um, those of you over Zoom. If you have a question, please send it to me in the chat and I will uh, read your question out. Okay, we're gonna start with Simon and then I will uh, write other people's names down. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I'm kind of interested uh, in how carbon taxes differ from net zero pledges in terms of these kinds of accounting problems. So, you know, for example, one problem you raise is, ah, well, when Australia mines coal and then sells it to China and China burns the coal, you know, some of these approaches won't count the coal. But it's interesting with a carbon tax, you know, even if you only impose the tax on China when it burns the coal, that adjusts prices. And so then that'll change the price of coal and will still affect Australia. So one thought that I had for net zero is to try to use like models of the hypothetical imposition of a carbon tax to quantify a notion of emissions. So whenever you have a carbon tax, you have have some, you know, uh, conversion between emissions and price, and you know, and uh, and a dollar amount. That's the tax that reflects the negative externality. So one thing you could do, for example, is you could try to look at the difference between Australia's actual GDP and what their GDP would be uh, counterfactually if there were a carbon tax, and then think of that difference as kind of the negative externality Australia is imposing on the world. That difference, you know, say that it's, you know. Uh, you know, a hundred billion dollars, and then we have a price that maps from, you know, an amount of money into carbon emissions and say, oh, well, that would be the same as, you know, uh, 50 million tons of carbon. And so then Australia, to be net zero, you'd have to off, you had to buy 50 million uh, tons of carbon offsets. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the interesting things is if you actually had like a But you're also right that um, countries have tried sometimes to sort of mimic um, have tried to sort of mimic this sort of proposal by in putting a carbon tax on exports from another country. So to deal with this problem of carbon emissions, for example, in the race system, we call it a cross border reduction, where there's like a tax that applies to importation of certain goods, where the assumption that emissions will be lost in those direct exports. So it's basically trying to close out. Yeah, so, yeah, as far as, like, what country, I think one of the things to do there is to give questions of responsibility. So, how much is paying for the direct reality? Um, and so this, that, that's, that's, like, an important question, but I guess that sort of question brings 
Uh, hey, Kristen. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the talk. I just have uh, a question about, I think it's clause 2B, which is like the input um, yeah. aspects. So I was wondering about a case, um, I'm thinking just as written down, maybe the account, I might not have totally grokked the whole thing, but uh, was maybe making a prediction that seems a little bit too strong to me. Like, suppose I'm X and I'm very cleanly producing some necessary input um, for a bit, really bad thing that Y produces. Uh, let's call it a widget. And the widget has many uses, and it just like it just happens, why, it, but it's a necessary condition for Y to, to make this really bad thing. Um, as I'm reading your clause 2B, all of the bad emissions that Y is making is being thrown back on me because I'm making this widget. And I'm just, I'm not, that's not really activating the same kind of intuitions as some of your other cases. I was wondering uh, what, what, you, yeah, what you're thinking. Yeah, so, so I'm providing a necessary means to Y to do this really bad thing. Yeah. It, it, you can do lots of things with what I'm selling it, but it happens to be the yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think... So one of the things there is who's to blame for this sort of activity. And then there's the other question of who's sort of, whose account should it fall, fall to the wrong one. So I think that there could be, there's this question of how the cost of ensuring that a country is, is maximum at zero is an open question. And it's, it's also an open question whether or not a country um, should take special responsibility for some of its emissions rather than others. So I would sort of offer an initial pitch that assuming that Y is sort of not part of this emitting the target, that those emissions do belong to the country. They are sort of the foreseeable downstream consequences of the selling for this. Now, whether or not um, you think that the cost of waste should be borne solely by Y rather than by you, that's a different question. So I want to allow this. It's a separate issue about how you should contribute the cost of doing enough value chain, and that's separate from what a value chain Maybe that's less counterintuitive than the idea that it doesn't belong at all on the party on, on, on our account, it belongs to both of the ones. And it's an open question who is sort of responsible for it, who should bear the cost of the and so forth. I'm going to intersperse myself here because my question is closely related. So I also wondered about this, about 2B. And I had a, a worry here that, um, so. Yeah, so X produces and sells a product, the use of which by Y will produce the, those emissions. So I had a worry here that there could be cases, and I think there are probably real life cases, where um, usually a richer country would sell, you know, say coal to some poorer country. And if the poorer country didn't buy this coal from this richer country, then they would be burning something dirtier. Mm -hmm. And so on a kind of counterfactual analysis of causation, then by exporting this uh, carbon emitter, then the rich country is actually lessening climate change. Um, and so you might worry that adding this to the ledger of the rich country is, um, at least in terms of like practical incentives, is seems yeah. uh, seems bad. Yeah. So I would I would want to say in that case that if you sell them the coal, then it belongs on your ledger. Um, now you may have a good reason for that sale, uh, and in fact you may think that this is a, um, although it. Let's say that as a result of this sale, you remain net positive um, in your national accounts. So I'm open to the fact that you could have very good justifications for not being net zero, and this could be one such reason. But nevertheless, it seems sort of strange that it's a, you know, it could also be true in the production case. 
So I'm, I'm producing goods and services, and, there's, and as a result, I'm emitting a lot. It's also, I know that it's the case that if I got out of this business, the next guy would come in and they would do an even dirtier job of it. So I think you're completely right that this would be a case where um, I am sort of causing and it's counter, if, if, if I get out of it, that higher emissions are counterfactually dependent on my conduct, but I'm not adding emissions. So that's how I want to draw the distinction. Nuri. Thanks. Um, so I had a question related to um, Nevins and Kyle's, which was, I'm, I'm not fully sure um, about the criteria for the accounting and how it requires that, I don't know, being good in the accounting leads to this constructive thing with respect to the global emissions goal, because it seems like the accounting is not a blame, it's not like, oh, all of the actions I'm blameworthy for as a country, uh, due to the answer you just gave to Kyle. That's not what we want from the accounting. But we want something that is a little bit inching in that direction, because otherwise it seems like it would just be fine to just have it be production based, right? So I'm just curious um, where it stands between those two. And maybe just what I was thinking um, was, for example, if I was like a vegetarian, right? I could imagine I have my ledger of how, how much meat I've consumed. And it seems like I could have that ledger of like, oh yeah, like, I don't know, five cows on my, <laughs> on my account that I'm responsible for. But if I'm goading other people to also eat meat, it seems like fine if that goes on their ledger and I'm just, yeah, like that's not my ledger, but I'm still responsible for goading them. Sorry, could you just give the last example? I missed Sorry, uh, imagine I'm a vegetarian. Yeah. Um, so I think that we ought to not eat meat. Yeah. It seems like I have some kind of second order thing of like, I should also not promote that others eat meat. So I was thinking like you could just have like the production based ledger. And I imagine you don't want that ledger because there's something in between the just being a production based or consumption based and it being like a list of all the stuff I'm blameworthy for. But I'm not sure what that thing in between those two is. Yeah. Yeah, so what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to track in terms of determining sort of what goes on the ledger is what would be required for a country to present its achievement of net zero, however measured in a certain way? Right. So could it, so let's take a vegetarian sort of example. Um, I think that in, in your case, you might think that you're not eating meat is in fact a good country, is you're not eating meat is in fact a contribution to a meat-free world. That's consistent with you doing other things that are inconsistent with that. Like for whatever reason, you tell lots of your friends that they should eat meat. So there are various different ways in which you may be counteracting this goal, but that doesn't make your stopping eating meat not a contribution to that goal. It just means that you're doing other things. So that could happen in the emissions case too. So for example, or even, even like, let's take the snow case. So I suppose I am, I shovel the snow from in front of my footpath and I actually don't put it in front of Steve's. I actually dispose of it well. Now I also buy up a lot of the shovels uh, at the town shop. And this makes it more difficult for other people to shovel there. I would say in that case, my shoveling of the snow from my path is a constructive contribution to the global goal. I'm also taking another action, which is not a constructive contribution to that goal. Whereas if I actually shovel the snow from my path just in front of Steve's, my shoveling of snow is not a contribution to the goal. Does that, does that help? So I wanna distinguish between something that um, where your the very nature of your action is constitutive of an impediment to the goal. And I want to distinguish that from a case where the same person, the same actor, does two different things, one of which is a genuine contribution to the goal, and one of which is not. Okay, I should add yeah. that. Are they, are they the that's that's how I'm trying to mark this territory. So I think there's another case I can um, 
So for example, um, the wrong analogy with Snowcase, suppose somebody um, adopts my mode of accounting uh, and but what they do is they become they become fully confidential in all their supply chain. But the way they do it is they buy up some very rare minerals for their own use, um, such that these minerals, which allow a very quick energy transition, are not available to others. So I would say that, that would be a case where, well, they, they're becoming net zero. They, they, they are, in fact, becoming, they are making a contribution to global net zero by zero use of it. Um, nevertheless, they are doing something with it. Thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, a couple of uh, tweaks to things that people have said before. So one is uh, sort of a worry about your particip participatory model. Uh, so it's already been observed that you're going to get double counting, uh, and you seem fine with that. You might, yeah, people, we reach global net zero before, perhaps without uh, everybody uh, reaching uh, individual net zero if we're double counting. Um, but, but a worry there is that if, if you treat um, sort of re um, with removals <laughs> symmetrically, then you might get the result that everybody achieves uh, net zero by, on their own ledger, and yet we don't re reach global net zero because multiple countries are claiming uh, credit for the same renewals. So that's one, one point. And then also I think, so as I, if, if I understand yeah, the basic thing you want is to be able to, to have an accounting for net zero where if somebody is, if a country is achieving net zero, then it will be contributing to global net zero. I just wonder though whether it would be better and easier just to send the message, just for the message rather to be, um, you know, stick with um, production-based uh, net zero, but just send the message, look, achieving net zero yourself is not enough. You also need to be worried about your impact on other countries' net, uh, net zero. And so you just need two principles, achieve production-based net zero yourself and make sure that you do not increase production-based emissions in other countries. Yeah, I, I, I sort of take the spirit of the second principle to be something I'm trying to sort of articulate to our second principle, right? Um, and in fact, it's, yeah, so it's it, it's even a little bit less ambitious than that, and that it's saying, um, ensure that you keep track of those emissions that arise in ways um, that may take us off this sort of track because of who the emissions are being produced by and their the nature of their commitments. Um, yeah, so I don't yeah we don't want it to be the case that you get you get. Uh, the perverse outcome that you have where in fact emissions are not at zero but somehow people are sort of everyone is claiming themselves to be net zero um, but we don't sort of see how that we would get that result so um, I kind of passed over this because of time Yeah, so effectively, if you put the removals and the emissions, you would sort of get this sort of two-tiered structure. So we're trying to figure out, first of all, like what belongs on X's ledger. And so first we look at whether or not they produced, produced it. If so, it's on their ledger. Um, if it was produced upstream or downstream, then it belongs on their ledger. And then we then check also any removals. So in the production case, it would be X removes them by paying for offsets themselves, or perhaps the upstream suppliers already did so. And we wanna say that that's just fine and it won't result in any, any funny accounting in that what it will ensure if, it's, if, if assessed correctly, it will give you an overall picture of whether or not there are any unoffset 
emissions within any particular value chain. Um, so that's how at least we're trying to make it work. Um, of course, allowing double counting, so this method is not a good way to find out how many total emissions are being produced. <laughs> For that, we still need to rely on like production-based accounting. Um, but this is not trying to, this is not offered as a, as a way of determining how many emissions there are, but rather what each country should claim as its emissions for the purposes of this sort of accounting. Um, um, hello. Hi. <laughs> Just testing the mic. So um, I guess I wanted to talk about normativity it felt to me like a lot of your reasoning was very instrumental like we just hold fixed we want global net zero and then we want to not let states get off the hook for making a contribution to net zero and i suppose one thing you could say about normativity is just like climate change is bad and so i'm just telling a story here about a collective action problem like i've got my normativity at the bad outcome and now i just want to divide up how we get to it so the instrumental reasoning is justified. I think that would be fine, but I was also trying to figure out whether it would be helpful to bolster some of the modes of accounting with independent normative reasoning and whether that could then come in at your final stage to help you justify your, what was it called, participatory value yeah. proposal. And of course, I didn't get very far in that because I'm just thinking about it now. But two things that I thought might be interesting, at, at least to um, hear more about or explore more. One was just that the um, consumption-based accounting story definitely seemed to have a complicity line to it, which I know you have worked on independently, uh, because there's that sort of sense that, like, I did these emissions yeah. for you guys over there. And then the thing that I got more stuck on, I think, was the extraction, the normativity in the extraction story. And that was just that when I do the parallel there to people thinking that you can be morally responsible for emissions of children, I find that completely implausible. So it's like but for reasoning, like it's Australia's coal. So there's this like counterfactual upstream reasoning, oh, it's your coal, so it's your fault that China burnt it. But I find that really implausible in the children case, that you had children and children are high emissions, so somehow you're meant to be responsible for them. I just, I hate that reasoning. And then I was trying to work through what do we say in the children case? I, I guess we say it's a really normatively valuable life project, so you're excused. And so what would the parallel be in the coal case? Well, we live under capitalism and we, we all have to yeah. do our stuff. So as you see, I haven't finished the thoughts, but I just wanted to hear if you had anything further, I guess, to say on the normativity of the three modes of accounting and yeah. how that might sort of bolster your proposal. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, so I have some thoughts. <laughs> about like the normativity that attached to them, but I found that, yeah, so for example, certainly sometimes you can become responsible for an outcome that you don't directly produce yourself if you commission someone to produce it for you, right? That's one way in which you can become responsible for an outcome. Another way in which you can, you can become responsible for an outcome is providing someone with the resources to produce that outcome. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so yeah, so those are clearly, and you know, cons consumption, part of the consumption idea, if you were to give it, try to give it a normative basis would be like, look, I'm effectively commissioning these people to do this activity for me, right? So they're kind of acting as my agent. Um, how do we know? Well, if I pay for it and they don't deliver it, then I complain to them, they haven't done what I've, Paid them to do so so that would be so i certainly think that there would be sort of independent um there are independent arguments about how these different ways of becoming related to outcomes either by being sort of causally upstream by providing the means to produce them by producing them themselves or by commissioning them to be produced could create those sorts of relationships um i've just been reluctant to lean too heavily into that here because I'm not trying to make it like a super moralized account of attribution. Um, partly it's, I mean, there are people who have produced, who have um, argued that 
our accounting should be really moralized so that uh, there's this nice Norwegian fellow who has this proposal and he calls it like inducement based accounting, but basically by inducement, he says that if you induced, if you induced the, um, the emissions, then they should be yours. But his notion of inducement is very heavily moralized and it seems to be like, if you're kind of res morally responsible for them. And my problem with that is that it just seems to not really map at all onto current net zero discourse at all, because like I can be morally responsible for emissions that I fail to prevent. And that seems like, like you're just doing something different. If you're saying that, if you know, the example I started out with, you know, I can, but don't prevent someone else from emitting. I'm certainly morally accountable for, I may be culpable for them, but to say that like, they're my emissions now, that seems a bit, a bit weird. So part of like, it's a little bit of a balancing act in that I'm not, um, I'm trying to do a bit of sort of imminent critique here where I'm sort of taking current discourse around net zero to some extent as it is for granted and trying to say, well, we have this, it's going, people are using this language. What sense do we make of it that, that doesn't violate this thing's grant that there's a distinction between whether or not somebody's responsible for a mission and whether or not they admitted? All right, thanks very much, Christian. So um, I, I, I like the point about sort of in principle possibility of this, the three different kinds of displacement, but I wonder what would happen if we, we looked at the actual likelihood of these different, th these three kinds of displacements. So it might, I mean, it seems like there's, there's kind of distinctive constraints associated with displacing in different ways. So like um, production seems to be pretty easy to, to move. But like if I said, all right, now I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna consume goods and services from a non-net zero country, that seems to limit my consumption in quite uh, drastic ways. That yeah, like displacing production doesn't like it's it's not that constrained. I, I I don't know. I mean, that that's the sense I get, I guess. And I just wondered if we incorporated um, estimates for likelihood of these three kinds of displacement rather than just in principle possibility, would that change the recommendation for which accounting system to to take on? And so the idea is that it's easier to, to displace without sort of radical change in the production case because somebody else will produce it somewhere, um, but not so much in the consumption case. Um, and the idea and the reason for that in the consumption case is that. Oh, I guess. I guess yeah. just certain kinds of goods and services just not. A, I mean, so if you say I'm, I'm not going to, I'm only going to consume from a non-net zero country, right? That's going to limit what kinds of things I can consume yeah. or the kinds of goods that I can consume. I guess. Yeah. So I'm not saying, of course, that you shouldn't, cons you should only consume things from a net zero country, from a non-net zero country. The only claim is that if you're consuming them from a not net non-net zero aligned country, you have to claim them as your emissions. Right, so it's not that, so the fact that it's easier or harder to make these substitutes doesn't, I think, make a huge difference. I think, I guess one way of saying this is that it might be more, it might be easier for countries to make non-costly displacements in the production space rather than in the consumption space. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. If that's true, then it's interesting. Um, and I guess that would just mean that if they adopted a system of accounting which was less displacement prone, it might be better considered on its own than the others because <laughs> for this reason, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, how the account was framed. And I guess I'm still not seeing exactly how the value chain works, like especially the removal process. So is, um, is the proposal equivalent to one which starts with the level one being uh, consumption based, and then you do like a similar substitution in the second level that's also value chain based? Um, 
So is that would that end up being the, the, the very same proposal or does the order in which you do the process matter? Uh, it should it shouldn't really matter. We just because of the way in which our we frame our two principles, the first one is sort of the production case. So does it yeah. and so there's no advantage to framing it that way? It's or even no as opposed to in consumption. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I guess I guess we do have this sort of view that you need to claim your production base. You do have to you have to claim those emissions no matter what. Yeah, okay. And that does seem intuitive. Like there is a certain primacy to like we're putting the stuff into the atmosphere here. It would it's pretty strange. It doesn't really matter who we're trading with or anything. We have to claim those. The question is whether or not we need to claim all other whether or not we need to simultaneously claim other emissions that are being produced elsewhere in value chains in which we're embedded. Okay. All right. That's helpful. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. So um, I was. This, I think this is related to that question, but I, it seemed to me that there were kind of two separable worries. One worry is that the method of accounting might lead to displacement in the case of uh, only partial compliance. But yeah. then I was also thinking, even in the case of full compliance, you might think that one of these methods of accounting is going to hit, you know, some countries more than others and impose more of a burden. So it seems to me like the production-based method of accounting was going to place more of a burden on the global south, and the consumption-based accounting was going to place more of a burden on the global north. Um, and, and it seemed to me like well, you're, in, in the case of full compliance, your uh, method of accounting is just reducing down to the production-based method. Um, and I could see somebody thinking that, no, we, sh you know, we, we should worry about displacement from non-full compliance. But in the case of full compliance, it should be you know, more consumption because we shouldn't be placing burdens on countries that are most recently developing. And it, it, it just felt like there was this other dimension of fairness with respect to who is going to bear the burdens uh, yeah. that that was not yeah. part of the discussion. I was wondering whether you could say something about why it should be production in the case of full compliance rather than one of the others. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so I, one thing of course is that I do think that the question of like where the emissions get registered is separable from the question of burdens, right? Because you, you could, it's an open question, yeah, the question of like, who should bear the costs of a country's achieving net zero before? Um, and there's no, there's no reason why, I mean, in fact, many countries might, it, it seems sensible to say that a system in which each country is taken to be responsible for zeroing at its emissions is unfair. I think I would agree with that. Um, so put in your, and so the one way to put your question is like, well, but given the world that we're in, where there does seem to be at least some strong presumption that countries are responsible for zeroing out their emissions, um, should we prefer a system where uh, allocating responsibility for zeroing in that, out emissions in that way tends to hit the richer countries more than I think I would agree with that. Right? So I mean, if you, I, I, I have some reservations about whether or not that would be true, because I just do think that if the efficiencies you're presented with, this classic consciousness, if it hits the rich countries more, it's not obvious to me that they would be, they would be taking the position that there might be more costs they're currently willing to take on to actually debate. Um, so, so in that case, yeah, you, you shift turn out that they have more emissions on their incentives, but the cost of debate seems to be increasing to such a degree that you're doing more than you're doing now. And it may be that the costs for developing countries would be decreasing. But you know, and you could say, well maybe they do that still, yeah. Um, that would be bad for them. But um, but I think if, if it really were the case that there would be reason to favor uh, if if it's true that the system of accounting, if there is a 
that would be true of something that comes to us today also. So I think there are like this justice considerations that really sort of shapes what we should try to show in ways that <clears throat> should depart from the system of accounting which would make the most sense of what companies are going to do. Um, thank you. I suppose in a way, I, uh, this sort of touches on something that was raised earlier. Sorry, are you hearing me all right? Are, sorry, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, I can. Yeah, sorry. Um, I suppose it really is, this is a question about the context in which this might be seen. So um, I was thinking at one point, it was interesting, you used the phrase imminent critique, because I was trying to think at one point how one might characterize this. And I suppose one way would be at the, at, the head, at the beginning of it and at the end of it, you might say other things being equal, right? Sort of ceteris paribus and let those other matters say, I'm not dealing with those other matters, but there are of course other matters, but let's just assume other things being equal and now I proceed. So minimally, it seems to me what you might be heard as suggesting is something less than imminent critique. I suppose it depends on what one means by imminent critique, but would be something like this, just consistency. You might say, to, look, given your professed claims, your method of accounting for your behavior doesn't match your professed claim. So I just want to point yeah. out to you that this is a sort of clarification, really, and just a bit of assistance here. Um, given what you're claiming you want, um, this isn't the best way of trying to achieve yeah. that. So let's just clarify the point. Now, but actually, it sounds a bit more like you're saying, well, that's just bad faith or let's say dishonesty that's going on here right people are saying one thing but their behavior shows that they're not really committed to it and if they were committed to it this is the thing this is the thing you'd you'd have to do so there is a sort of we've edged into the territory of a moral evaluation here because it sounds like something like dishonesty or bad faith or something of that sort but then i still sort of hear you saying but I want to abstract as much as possible from or be neutral with regard to larger ethical questions. So, for example, a very obvious thing that would arise, and in a sense it seems to me has already arisen in the context of what you're saying, though you didn't yourself address, it would be sort of fair terms of cooperation. So it seems in that respect the context of justice is at issue. So it's not just a question of as were, whether my behavior is authentic or honest and so on, it's whether the terms in which I'm entering into relationships with others, given this is a multi-party activity, are terms of fair cooperation. But then if you're going to consider questions of fair cooperation, then it seems to me it's very difficult not at that point to start to look at things like dispositions and motives and history and intentions and double effect. And also there's a whole set of things that the terms of fair cooperation can't be set, set just abstractly from the motivations of the agents, the character of the agents, the history of the agency, and so on and such like. So I, I really, I suppose it's partly for clarification. Is what you're trying to do, and I could perfectly well understand this, as a matter of prudence, you might think the best chance of actually improving the situation is to try to abstract from ethical considerations insofar as that is possible. Um, but even if you go that way, you haven't quite <laughs> abstracted from them because I think it's not just inconsistency. There's a suggestion of dishonesty or inauthenticity or something of that sort. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that clearly there are issues about what are fair terms of cooperation, uh, and those are important questions. Uh, there are important questions about, you know, if we agree that it's an important moral goal to mitigate, and there are questions about who should bear the cost of that sort of mitigation. Um, so obviously those are sort of important questions. Um, and I'm just trying to not sort of presuppose an answer to them in settling this other question of how to determine which emissions sort of belong to which agent for the purposes of deciding how they ought to be mitigated. 
Now, you, when you mentioned the consistency thing, so I don't want to be, I don't want to tie it too closely to what they profess, because then it's about, well, what they actually said. <laughs> and I don't want to rely too much on, now there are countries that actually do say very specific things, but I was trying to uh, put an interpretive gloss about more the context in which they're making such commitments as having, creating a certain structure, right? So that um, if, if the, the purpose of these national, if these net zero commitments are defined as nationally determined contributions to global net zero, independent of a country saying anything, um, when they're saying, okay, this is my net zero target and this is my nationally determined contribution to global net zero, I think that carries a certain weight in terms of what, what, what the meaning of their commitment is supposed to be and how we can sort of interpret it independently of what they're actually specifically professing. Um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah. I guess I would disagree with that. I would say that if, if a country, however non-culpably, is producing emissions, then those emissions should count. It, it does not count as a net zero country simply because it has a good justification for producing without offsetting. Is it a fault with what? That's what I was, it was the latter that I was saying. So I would say, yeah. So is this an empirical criteria? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a ten, it's, 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 it's an empirical criteria. So it's saying that we allocate, that the question of which emissions belong to different countries is settled independently of moralized criteria about our responsibility for achieving mitigation of the spread among different players. measurement in some sense is, is useful because it puts a certain meaning and purpose in it and so on, right? So I, I think it's an interesting question to ask about, you know, who's produced, who's, who's, whose emissions are these? Um, and that that is not something that we need to have a complete moral theory to determine. Well, that's something like the business of anyone. I think I'm gonna yeah. gonna cut us off there because we're we're at time. Um, so with apo with apologies to those who uh, whose questions we didn't get to, let's thank our speaker. Yeah.